Hello and welcome to another tutorial. This time around we are going to be taking a look at setting up some custom data structures uh, that we're going to be using in Unity but we could apply to uh, other projects in C Sharp as well. And in particular what we're going to be looking at is data structures to organize spatial information. So the first one we're going to look at is something called a quad tree which we can use that for organizing two-dimensional data. So let's dive on in and take a look at what we're working with. So I've put together a bit of a test bed here. And so what the test bed allows us to do is we have this spawn surface, which can spawn a configurable number of obstacles. In this case, it's spawning 10,000 of them. And we have a minimum and a maximum radius that those can be. And then we have this holding object that'll hold our quad tree. And then we have this player object, and the idea is, is we'll be able to move the player around. And one of the very basic functions for a quad tree is going to be retrieving what obstacles are in a short range from the player. So let's look at what the existing infrastructure is that we've got, because there is a few bits of existing infrastructure. So to begin with, what I have set up, if we look at the obstacle 2D, so it has a couple of basic things. This script is on all of those obstacles that get spawned. So it has information about the collider and the mesh renderer, and part of the reason for that is that it's able to go and mess with the color. So it has this option for being able to highlight or, re or remove the highlight. Because uh, the idea is, is the ones within our radius, we want to apply a highlight to them. If we take a look over at our player, what our player has is a couple of things. One of the things is it has this ability for checking if we have moved. So it keeps track of the last location where it cached data, where it looked for obstacles and it go, is able to tell us has it actually moved from that. We are able to be keeping track of those nearby obstacles that we've found. So for this we're using something called a hash set. So a hash set is gives us something that is very fast when we're wanting to do operations like addition or removal or checking if something is contained within a set, which those are actually the main operations that we're doing. So we're going to be making use of that rather than a list. Uh, the performance is significantly better using a hash set. The other thing you might notice that we're going to make a little bit of use of that you may not have seen before is this thing of doing a variable name and then a question mark after it. So this makes that variable what's called nullable. Normally, a struct can't be assigned to null, and vector2, vector3 are a struct. They can't be set to null. So we don't have an indicator of are they actually invalid. Having this marks this as being a nullable variable. So what we can actually do, and we'll see this down here, we can check if that nullable variable is null, or uh, we've moved. Then we cache the 3D position and we store the 2D position. And then we tell it to highlight nearby obstacles. So we can see here the interface for the quad tree. So you can ask it for, cool, get me all of the ones within range of this position, again in 2D, and here's the search range. So there are other interfaces that we can add to the quad tree and that in a future tutorial I will show adding in some additional ones. I'd like to show things like uh, being able to find just the exact nearest, being able to do things like raycast, stuff like of that. But for now we've got this search in range option. And so having the interface created to begin with is a really good way of making sure that you implement what you actually need. And I find there are some things when, at least when I'm working with them, where it's easy to go off on a tangent of implementing something and then finding you need different information. So I try to implement for things like of that, those interfaces first. 
So the interfaces won't actually be doing anything. So like if the quad tree just returns null for that, but I want it to be having that interface there so I know what's going to happen. Then we have, it's going to be checking if for any new ones, which very easy to do because contains is quite a rapid option. Uh, the candidate ones, if there's nothing there, there's nothing further to do. If this is our first time finding a new set, we store it in process. And so this will just really, all of this code is about actually updating the highlight. That's all it does. So that's what the player is going to be doing. It's going to be talking to the quad tree, getting the information and going from there. We have this random item spawner, which because I intend to further you know, extend this, adding in 3D support, at the moment it has a mode option that's forced to 2D. And I've got a couple of little events here for things so I can get notifications on the bounds being calculated, when each individual item is spawned, when all of them are spawned, and then we just perform that spawning picking random locations. And it also randomizes the scale at the same point in time. That connects up to this quad tree bridge, uh, which the idea is, is this sort of does any further conversion stuff like of that to the particular format the quad tree needed. And we can see we, it goes and grabs this interface, I spatial data 2D. So what I want to do is, and at the moment it's, that interface, I've said that it exists, and we'll look at it a bit more once we actually start to populate information into it, but it's essentially going to be our way of bridging, uh, allowing our quad tree to store kind of any bit of 2D information. The only requirement will be that that bit of you know, 2D information implements that interface, so it allows us to make our quad tree a bit more generic while also making it uh, very specific in terms of how we need it to work. I'm going to set it up so it supports just adding individual items. And while I will have support for it being able to have an array of ones added, or in this case, a list of ones, what I want to do is for that, intentionally have that off, but just output some stats. And in particular, the stats on how many nodes we've got, things like that. So we're in a position now where we can start to actually get things implemented. So I'm going to start with the quad tree itself, and we're going to start with how that's organized. So how a quad tree works, and this is the principle behind it being called a tree and basis for a lot of tree structures, is we take the information and then at the base level, we have a bounding area and we divide that into quadrants, so into four sections. And we put each bit of data in the quadrant where it actually overlaps. If it overlaps multiple, then it goes in multiple quadrants. And the key thing is, is what we can do is we don't just break it up into four. Each one of those four nodes can split also into four and further and further. So one of the things we can control with the quad tree is what is the smallest node size we want to allow, how many things we want to try and generally have at maximum in a node. And this allows us to organize our information so that when we're doing things like that search for obstacles in an area, first we find the nodes that overlap with that area and then we can check the obstacles within that. So it means we're only checking against a very small subset of the data. So it lessens the amount of data we have to process. So that's one of the big things that tree structures do is they allow us, and in particular these sort of spatial trees, is it allows us to have to do significantly less data processing. We reduce the amount of things we need to process. So, if we jump over to the quad tree, the idea behind this iSpatial 2D interface is it tells us the 
essentially the information about our object. So it tells us where it is and the bounds of it. That's the two key essential bits of information we need. So it's going to have in it a function vector2 get location. And it is also going to have, and we'll, because it's 2D, we'll return a rect, and it's going to have get bounds. So that's all that has to be implemented. So if we go over to our obstacle 2D, we want to say that this implements I spatial data 2D. So it has to implement that interface. Now what that means is we've got to set up some of these functions. So we need to have our methods for doing that. So we can also use the potential fixes option uh, and tell it to apply them. So what we get is we get a couple of these functions here and now we need to implement these. So again, this information, I don't want to have to calculate it every time because I'm creating a vector two, I'm creating a rect. And I also with this information, if the obstacles move, change size, this data could have changed. So what I'm going to do is similar to what I did for the player. So we're going to have a vector three, haste position. We're going to then have a nullable rect for our cached bounds. And we're going to have a nullable vector two for our cached 2D position. Then we have a similar thing for our bool has moved. And we have our similar setup with a get. And this is going to be quite similar to what we had for uh, the actual player, where we want to check f mathf approximately. And we want to go and say transform.position minus cached position. And we get the square magnitude and we check if that is not approximately zero. So that's going to catch if it's moved only a small amount. So that's good. So then what we want to do here is we'll get location. What that's going to do is F cached 2D position is null then we want to cache position data like that. Otherwise, what we will do is we will return uh, cached 2D position dot value. We can do an almost identical thing here with the bounds, where what we'll do is if our cached bounds is null, do the same there. So now what we need to set up is this cache position data function. So, well, first thing it's going to do is cache position is our transform dot position. So we store the actual location. We want to store our 2D position. So that's a new vector 2. And we use transform position X and in this case, not Y, but Z. So that's good. We've got the position cached. Now we need to cache the rect. So what I'm going to do to make that a little bit easier is we'll have half width is our linked collider bounds size x like that and our half height is except not rather than being y it'll be z 
Then we can calculate our cached bounds. Is a new rect. Well, we have our cached 2D position. And actually, I'll use cached position. Actually, no, I'll use transform position x just to be consistent. So minus half width, transform position z minus half height, and then half width and half height. So that'll store that information. So that's good. We're actually completely done with that. We've got now the information here. It all, if our obstacle moves, this will update. Now we're not giving that information yet to the quad tree. That's again something in a later pass that we'll do for updating the quad tree, having things move. For the moment, we're just supporting the player moving. So we've got the necessary information for describing the size of things. Now, we already know we've got a few of our interfaces here, and we want to start getting those implemented and functional. Okay, so now that we've got the information there available to us in terms of the bounds, let's start to fill out a couple of the uh, key areas that we've got for this. So one of the main things with the quad tree is I talked about this idea that it splits into four things called nodes, and each of those nodes can split again and again and again. So what I'm going to do is the first thing I'm going to do is set up a basic version of our node class. And we're actually going to end up with most of our logic sits inside the node because a lot of the code that we write when we're working with tree structures is recursive. So a function calls itself, essentially. So, okay, a node. If we think about what a node has, we know it has to have bounds. So it's going to need a rect for bounds. A node can, but doesn't have to have children, but if it does, it can only have four of them. So it's going to have children. Now, the other thing that we could easily miss at this point and that we don't strictly need to have, but I think is a very useful thing to have in there is storing the layer of it or the depth. So I'm going to initially set that to minus one, just so we know if we've accidentally uninitialized something or not initialized a node properly. So a depth, zero will actually be the very top level node and anything below that will be an increasing number. So minus one just lets us catch uninitialized data. Kind of like to do things like if that were possible. Now a node can hold the information. So we're going to use our hash set again and that's using our interface. So this can work generically for a lot of different things. So that's good. And I'm going to give the node a constructor. That we're going to say rect in bounds. Uh, and you'll notice uh, anyone who, if you've worked with Unreal, I have uh, fallen into using the Unreal coding <laughs> conventions uh, over in C Sharp and Unity. And a big part of that is I really actually quite like their style. And I'm going to change that to in depth. Uh, I really like the coding conventions there. I find it is uh, quite a clear one. And because I'm spending a lot of time uh, coding in Unreal these days, it actually makes it significantly <laughs> easier uh, on my brain to try and remember if it's, I keep the, my coding standards for things fairly similar. They're already quite close, but I'm just going with keeping them a little bit closer. So, okay. Let's start to, we've got our basics here for the class, for that node one, and we're going to now start to set up a couple of our bits of data and everything for this. So our quad tree is going to have a node that is our root node, and prepare tree is our setup one. That gets run when we're ready to create the tree. And what this is going to do is we're going to go root node, 
is a new node. We give it the bounds like that. So that's good. Okay, so we wanna have a couple of configuration parameters for our quad tree. Now I want things to be able to query these, but I don't want them to be able to be written to. So this is where I wanna have it as a property. And a couple of things that I want. One is the preferred max data per node. So the idea is, is this is, this is the amount of data that it tries to have at maximum in a node, but as we'll see, there are reasons why we might not be able to always adhere to that because there's a finite level to which we can split our nodes. And there's a finite level for one big reason. Well, actually there's two reasons. One reason is there's diminishing returns on splitting it because we have more data to trawl through. And so there's this balance with the size of our quad tree, the amount of nodes to traverse through there and being able to gain efficiencies. The other thing is, is if our nodes get too small, it's quite possible to get to the point where with a floating point number that we're using, we can't actually accurately represent the size of the uh, node. And then that's going to also cause problems. So what we want to also have here is a public, and there's no reason for this to be anything other than an integer. So minimum node size. Yeah, size is fine for that. And we'll make that two. So no node can be smaller than two by two meters. So that's good. So, okay, we've got prepare node. We wanna look at how these functions, we want them to work. And again, setting up the interfaces first is the way that I would generally go. So I want this to be able to go and say, okay, well, root node, add, and we'll actually add data, we'll keep the naming the same. So what I want it to be able to do is I want it uh, to, it's going to need the quad tree that it's adding to just in case it wants to retrieve configuration settings, saves passing those settings through and everything. And we give it our bit of data. Here where we're adding multiple, well again, what I wanna do, and we'll just fix up the naming, is I'll run our internal function here. The reason I'm doing this of calling this function rather than calling a version of this, which I could, is just in case there was anything additional we wanted to add or do here, I've got one point that I update. I don't need to go and update it in multiple places. I'm not duplicating code. It's the main reason for doing that. So, okay. I need this add data function now in the node. And as I said, most of the logic that we have is going to sit in the node itself. So we're going to have a function here that is going to be add data. And it's going to take in our owning quad tree. And we have our spatial data that comes in. So, okay, we wanna think about what we need to do with this. And I'm gonna split stuff out into a lot of separate functions. And again, I'm going to follow that approach of write a function that doesn't exist yet so that I know how I need this to work. So at the beginning, we've got a single node. And if we don't have any children, then we would just start storing data into that node. So that's probably a good starting point. So f children is null, then we wanna also check, cause I'm avoiding allocating things that I don't need to. So if data is null, then data will allocate that. So first data for node. 
So we're only allocating things when we need them. So, okay, that's good. What we then want to do is check, okay, have we reached a point where we should be trying to split the node? Because the at a minimum, you know, our fallback here that we would do is we would do data, add, and then the datum, like that. But if we've got too much data, we should be looking to see if we can split the node. And this is the logic that we follow, is we get data coming in and we go, okay, do we need to split? Yes, okay, then we split. So it's not a quad tree that has a fixed structure. We don't allocate all the nodes we need. We allocate them on a case-by-case -case basis when we need them. So to know if we should be trying to split. Well, if our data count plus one, so the new amount of data, if that is greater than our owner's preferred max data per node, we could actually go greater than or equal to. So if that condition is met, then we may want to split. Not we must split, but we may want to, because remember, we've also got that size. So we want to check if we are actually able to safely split. So and can split with the owner provided. So what can split does is its job is pretty straightforward. We're going to have bool can split. We provide the quad tree owner. And we need to check. Okay, well, return. So it can split if the bounds, the bounding sphere, if our bounds width is greater than our owner minimum node size times two. Could actually do greater than or equal to. So if the width is greater than that and, so this should be an and not an or, because we need both of the bounds uh, to be large enough. So owner minimum load size times two. So we're making sure that we have our node is large enough to safely be able to split. So in this case, reached the split point and permitted two. So when we do that, all of the data that we do hold flows down to the child nodes. So we actually only add to this if we're not able to split, or we haven't met the criteria for splitting yet. And then we can just do a return. Now we'd start to get into the fun area where, okay, we need to handle how we actually do the splitting. So first thing I want to do is I want to be able to do split node and we give it the owner. So not can split, split node. So okay, let's have a look at what split node needs to do. So its job is to take this current node and divide it into four children. And then it's going to need to redistribute the data between them. So, okay, a couple of helper things that are gonna make this a little bit easier for us, because we're splitting things in half. Let's cache out our half width. So bounds width divided by two, and our half height. And let's also cache the new depth. New depth is our depth plus one. So, okay, well, we can allocate the children. So the children is a new node. We have four 
This is one of the few cases where I consider it completely reasonable to hard code a number. Because it's a quad tree, it's always going to have four children. I think it's very appropriate to be doing that with this. So then, okay, the way we split this up is it splits evenly. So we have bottom left, bottom right, top left, top right. And that's usually the order that I build them in. The order doesn't matter. The key thing is making sure that they are actually all different. So what I'm actually going to do, this is where multi-line editing is honestly just the my favorite thing. We're gonna have a new node. That. Each one of these needs to be given a rect, which we'll get to the data for that in a moment. We provide the depth. Now location wise here, I'm going to go bounds, x min, bounds, y min, our half width, because that's the actual new full width of those, and then half height. So this isn't exactly right yet, obviously. This would only give us the bottom left four times. But for then getting the bottom right, all we have to do is that. For getting the top left, all we have to do is this. Then for getting the top right, it's the combination of both of those. So this is actually, and it seems like it's something where this, how could you possibly get this wrong? This is honestly the area with a quad tree where it is most easy to actually make mistakes. Uh, this is where it can really go wrong uh, quite easily. So highly recommend taking your time with this, carefully checking things. It's easy to get stuff like an X and a Y swapped around to get the order of things wrong. Uh, very, very easy to have happen. So, okay, we've created the children. They've got the right information. We need to transfer all of our data now over to the children. So this is where I want to have we distribute the data. So for each datum in data. So I want to have this function add data to children. And we'll implement that shortly. Uh, once we've done doing the splitting, we set data to null because we're not storing it. Now that add data to children function, I haven't implemented it yet. And the reason is, is we actually would use that up here as well. So when we have children, we would do add data to children. And we would provide again, the owner and the data like that. Oops, datum. So, okay, we can now set up our add data to children function. So, add data to children. So, it's going to have a quad tree owner, like with all of them. I could store that on the node. But that's extra data we're storing that we're only really using in a very narrow scenario. So I don't think it's actually worth doing that. Uh, this is a case where I think it's better just to be passing the uh, information around. So, okay, now we're ready to add the data to the children. So when we're adding it to the children, as I said at the beginning, that data might belong just to one child, might belong to two or three, because the data isn't just a location, it has a range around it. So it could overlap multiple. So what we do is we add it to each one. So what I'm going to need to be able to do is loop over all of the children like that. And then I want to be able to go and say, okay, well, if the child 
overlap. So if that node would overlap with the datums bounds, then what I would do is I would go child add data owner datum. And this is the recursive part. It's actually going and calling that same add data function we set up here. And it will just go through, fill out the nodes and split them as and when it needs to. So now I need to have this overlap function. Uh, so what I'm going to do is set up a bool overlaps rect other and this one's actually really easy because we can just go bounds overlaps other. So that's actually pretty good. That we'll go and check to make sure we don't have any errors. But that should actually be generating the quad tree now. And if I run it, we want to make sure there's no errors, which is no errors. We don't see any other data though. So this is where I want to start being able to report stats. Now we don't want that on all the time because collecting the stats takes time. It's extra processing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have quad tree track stats as a define up here. And then what that lets me do is down here, whenever I go and do things like splitting a node, I can check if that is defined. And then I want to go and do something like owner, uh, update max depth, or maybe have it a uh, new node created and we provide that new depth so it can be keeping track of that. I want to keep track of things like how many nodes I've added. So actually that I might also pass in four. So we give it the number of nodes and that. So on nodes created, or new nodes created. So then I can set up a function down here where we'll put these, I think right at the end is probably a good spot for it. So we're going to have int max depth is minus one, int null nodes is zero. And then we'll have a public void. So we'll have the different function or well, the function that we set here, new nodes created. Uh, num nodes or num added. And we'll also have node depth. So then this is pretty straightforward num nodes gets num added added into it and node depth becomes the max of our max depth and our node depth so that's some data that we can keep track of we can log that out here with this and again we keep this all just in this hash if. It's really handy for adding in extra diagnostics. It means you don't need to remove the diagnostics, but you can have them not have any performance impact when you don't when you want to shut them off. Really, really handy. I highly recommend doing things like of this, especially when you're setting up uh, tools like this. So we're going to do a debug log. Max depth. Log that out. And also log out no nodes.
that's good. So when I prepare the tree, I'm going to just reset those stats so that we know that they're all pristine. Uh, just means that if we do things like you know, clear out the tree, stuff like of that, all of that data is up to date. Okay, so we've got the stats being logged out and tracked. We do have one typo here, which will fix that up. And then we're going to go and run this. And what we'll see, so it's gone to a depth of four. So in total, that we've got 340 nodes. So that's good. We know that it seems like it's splitting up the data. We just need to now get it actually using it, which means this find data in range is what we need to get up and running. So we need to make it work. So what we're going to do for the find data in range is a couple of things. Firstly, I want to be able to track the timing of this and how long it takes, because this is one of the big things is this, we want it to be fast. So what I'm going to have here is a stopwatch. So that's a new system dot diagnostics stopwatch like that. And we're going to start it. Then at the end, we will stop it. And what we do, so we go stopwatch.stop, .stop, and I'm just going to debug log, and we'll say the search found however many results in, and we want to output the time. So we'll say stopwatch elapsed milliseconds. So we have an indication of how long it took. Now the data, we're returning a hash set. So this is going to be our found data. We can allocate it to begin with. We return that here. That's good. Now, okay. We need to do a search. What we're wanting to do is we're wanting to find all of the ones within a range. And we need to, that's a circular range. But what we're going to do is first construct a bounding box for this. And we're going to retrieve things in that bounding box. And then we're going to go and uh, specifically do the actual radius filtering because that's actually the, the easiest part. So our search rect is a new rect. We have our search location dot x minus search range. Search location dot y minus search range. And then our width and height is our search range, and in both cases, times by two. We just define that, so we know the rectangle that we're searching in. So what I wanna do now that I've got that search rect is I wanna go, okay, well, root node, find data in box, and we give it our search rect, and we give it the found data, but I want that to be as a, actually it doesn't need to be a ref. So this will find all of the data. So now we know the function that we need up in our node. And again, most of the logic goes into the node. So I'm going to set up our find data in box function. So find data in box. It's going to have a search rect. And then we have a hash set of the data. 
So out found data. Okay, so now we're ready to start populating this. So, okay, a couple of things that we could be doing here. Because we've got the scenario of if we've got no children, we've got the scenario of if we do have children, and if we do have children, then what I would do is for each var child in children and if that child overlaps with the search rect then we run and we'll actually fix up the naming of that we run our find data in box function exactly like that so if we've got children, it's really, really easy. What if we don't though? So if children is null, well, there's definitely gonna be a return in there. Now we've got a couple of options of what we could do here. One is we take all of the data and shove it in. Now we could also have no data here, in which case let's check if data is zero. Uh, we should also check if data is null, then we return. So if we've got no data, it's easy. If we have data, two options. We take one is we take all of the data because we know it overlaps with the search rect and shove it in there. The other is that we do some filtering at this point. And we can test and see what we get for performance. So for now, I'm going to feed all of the data in. So for a hash set, we do union with and that's going to bring that data in. So that looks good. So what we would be getting back here now is we would be actually getting back all of the particular bits of data. We need to make sure that function is accessible. So that would give us back quite a large area. And we could test and see what that looks like. Because this should give us back data now. So we'll run this and we can see it's highlighting there. But we see it's quite large and blocky, the area. So we can do better than that. We can do the actual radius filtering. because our, So our hash sets make doing this really simple. We would do found data. And we can go and do a remove where. So we have our datum. So search location minus our actual uh, datum get location. So we want, want, want to remove ones where search location minus that one and we get our square magnitude is greater than our search range squared. Now, if one's just outside of it, but its radius brings it into it, it would get excluded as well. So we can potentially refine this. We just want to see how this uh, behaves now. So what we can do is we can come back here. We see we get a circle. We can see the retrieval time for this is quite low. Uh, you know, it's found a bunch of results there very, very rapidly. So that's looking really good. Uh, the performance there is excellent. Let's add a little bit further to this because what I want to do is I want to have that removal check actually happen up in here. I want to have a public void find data in range and I want to be able to give it my vector2 search location float search range. So we're moving this out of the quad tree into the actual node itself. 
So we still have the same hash set like that. Uh, and again, that same out found data. So this is actually going to bring in pretty much all of this logic here uh, is what I'm going to do. So we're going to take all of this, bring this up to here. We're creating the search rect. Uh, it's going to do a find data in box. So largely unchanged from what we did have. Uh, the one thing that I will add in here is an assert. So we've set that up. And what that means is now down here, I can just actually go and say our uh, root node find data in range, and we just provide all of that. So it's doing all of the necessary logic here uh, for setting this up, which is good. What I could also do is I could have that be you know, potentially null and could be allocating it. Depends on how I want the interfaces to work. But so far, so good. Now with this, that find data in range is really only appropriate for it to be run when this is at the root node. Doing this on something other than the root node would not really be accurate. So if depth is not equal to zero, then what I want to do is throw uh, and invalid operation exception is probably a reasonable one. Uh, find data in range cannot be run on anything other than the root node. And we'll do a return. Not that it's strictly necessary. So if the depth is not zero, then it's going to fail out. So it only runs it on the root node. So that's good. We can check and make sure that that still works. So no errors, it's picking up stuff can see that the query time is nice and quick. Now I did mention that with this, it does require, you know, if it's just on the edge, it's going to miss ones if they overlap into it. So that's something where we can actually account for that. Uh, it makes our search condition here a little bit uh, more complicated, but that's okay. So what I can do to improve this, it does make this a little bit more complicated. So we have to split this across multiple lines. And what I'm going to do is, if I kept it exactly as it was, it would look like that. So what I want to do is I want to encapsulate the fact that the datum actually has a little bit of size to it. So I'm going to have a test range, or we might make this a working search range. Is search range plus datum, and then this I kind of need a get radius function, something that gives us that sort of maximum extent there. Uh, and then that allows me to, actually I might change that to test range. So now I need to have this get radius function uh, in our interface here. So I have a get radius. Obstacle 2D is obviously going to need that as well now.
And what we would do is a similar thing. I will have a float cached radius, which will do same logic we've done with this. Cached radius, and then we'll return the value. And then to get that information, well, cached radius is going to be a mathf square root of half width times half width oops, plus half height times half height. We're getting essentially that hypotenuse there because we're working with sort of any collider size here. So that should do the trick. That means this is going to be testing uh, the proper radius there. So that should work a little bit more precisely, probably not to a level where we'll notice. Uh, and we might see a performance impact there with that. That would not be surprising, but it should be a bit more uniform. And we do get a little bit more data returned. We've got a couple hundred more coming back than we were before. And that's those additional extra little ones that we're getting back in there. So we have our quad tree set up working quite nicely. We can find data quite rapidly. And as you can see, we're zooming around here and it works quite quickly. We don't get any errors if we go off the map. And it's processing quite a large amount of data quite rapidly. Uh, we can ramp up the amount of things we're spawning. So if I go up to say 20,000, so we're doubling the number. We'll save beforehand because we want to be a little cautious. So even with that, to get back 3,000 odd results, and it's processing that in a very, very small time. And this is updating way more frequently than we normally would for a scenario like of this. But it can comfortably process that amount of data. Uh, I might reduce that and we can test some other things here is we can see, okay, well, the quad tree, what if I allowed the node size to go down to a meter? What happens then? You know, because there is a balance there in terms of performance, and it would help if I move the player, not the quad tree. So we see about the similar performance there. And if we look at the number of nodes, we've got a lot more nodes, only with just a small extra depth. Uh, we could, with the quad tree, you know, go back to two, and we could allow, you know, 500 per node. And we can see the different bits of performance that we get. Again, trying to make sure I move the player. So performance is staying pretty good because it's going that quick, uh, regardless that we're not noticing much of a difference. But you can adjust and balance these based upon the needs for your particular project. Uh, and how you balance that is going to be a little bit of trial and error. It's going to depend a bit on the density of stuff. but we have our working quad tree and we're able to query it. We're able to get information out of it very rapidly. Now we are going to be in future tutorials extending this. I want to add in things like raycasts, add in stuff like of um, removal and things moving around the quad tree to make things. So we've got uh, a few more options there of what it can do and also extending it into fully in 3D is really helpful if we're doing things like pathfinding or moving uh, in 3D space. The one very small addition that we need to make to fix up an issue is this add data to children. Uh, so that was missing there from in our add data when we split a node. So what that meant is the bit of data that caused a split actually then got emitted from the quad tree. So we got things left out. So it's just a quick little fix there that needs to be added in for that. Thanks folks, hope you found the video interesting and helpful. If you have, chuck in a like and subscribe, really helps out, it's really appreciated. If you've got any questions, chuck in a 
comment below. If there's other things you'd like to see, mention that in a comment also. If you're looking for the code for the project, the code is available up on GitHub, and there is a link to that in the description below. You can use this in any of your own projects, commercial or non-commercial ones. And if you are looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there is a link to that in the description as well. But until next time, bye.